You are stealing my house. And if I don't steal it, someone else is going to steal it. No, no one. A battle to save Palestinians from eviction triggers the latest rallying call against Israel. Hundreds have been injured in violent protests. So why is tension over this small neighborhood heating up now? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Imran Khan. Sheikh Jarrah makes up just a tiny part of occupied East Jerusalem. But the area is a major source of tension between Palestinians and Israelis. A recent order to evict Palestinian families has triggered violent protests, particularly around Al-Aqsa Mosque, not far away. Israeli security forces fired tear gas and stun grenades to disperse demonstrators on Friday. More than 200 people were injured. The UN, the US and the EU are calling for restraint. Harry Fawcett explains why Sheikh Jarrah's future is so contentious. This has become a nightly scene in the East Jerusalem neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah. Vigils and protests aggressively broken up by Israeli security forces. At stake, the homes of hundreds of Palestinians, long subject to an eviction campaign. The current tensions were sparked partly by this viral video in which local woman Muna al Kurd confronts a Jewish settler. You are stealing my house. And if I don't steal it, someone else is going to steal it. It was an acknowledgement of just how close Muna's family and three others are to being forced out. They've lodged a final appeal with Israel's Supreme Court, which is now saying it will hold another session on Monday. Muna's father, Nabil, who has already had one house seized by settlers, fears what could happen if the court rules against them. We'll be in the streets because all of us, like me, we are old people. We don't work, we don't have incomes, and the cheapest rent around here is $2,000. How can we afford it? The homes were built for Palestinian refugees in an arrangement between the United Nations and Jordan during the period of Jordanian rule after 1948. A Jewish settler organization says the land was owned by Jews before 1948 and should be returned in light of Israel's seizure of East Jerusalem in 1967. The lawyer representing the Palestinian families says their counterclaims of ownership have not been properly assessed by the courts. We are dealing with the domestic legal uh, system that uh, rejects and denies the international humanitarian law and the international law uh, as should be applied in East Jerusalem. The family's legal battle has been constrained by the limits of Israeli law, which Israel seeks to apply here in occupied East Jerusalem. But there is another legal argument based on international law and Israel's obligations as an occupying power. An argument that requires political pressure. Some has come from campaign groups and diplomats in recent weeks. Britain's mission to the Palestinians tweeting out this video statement. The restitution and planning laws here and their implementation are unfair and they breach Israel's obligations as an occupying power. Since the start of the holy month of Ramadan, tensions in East Jerusalem have been unusually high. From Gaza, Hamas's military wing is warning of a high price for Israeli actions in Sheikh Jarrah. The consequences of a mass eviction here could be felt well beyond the families under threat of losing their homes. Mahmoud! Mahmoud! Harry Fawcett, Al Jazeera, occupied East Jerusalem. Social media sites have been accused of blocking content on the protests. Instagram removed several videos and photos carrying the Save Sheikh Jarrah hashtag in English and in Arabic, including those posted by Al Jazeera. Some activists say their Facebook and Twitter posts were blocked. Instagram apologized and blamed a bug in the system. The other social media platforms haven't yet responded. Joining us now are our guests in occupied East Jerusalem, Fadwa Khadr, a political activist, a member of the Palestinian People's Party, the PPP. In London, Yossi Meckelberg, Professor of International Relations and Associate Fellow of the Middle East and North Africa program at Chatham House. And in Boston, Rami Khouri, Senior Public Policy Fellow and Professor at the American University in Beirut. Rami is also a Senior Fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. A warm welcome to you all. I'd like to begin in occupied East Jerusalem with Father uh, Fadwa Khadr. Uh, 
We've seen evictions like this take place over several decades. They've happened in other neighborhoods in occupied East Jerusalem. Yet this one seems to have cut right to the core of what is going on between the Israelis and the Palestinian and has become a very popular cause. Why is that? Uh, well, you know, even as you have said that uh, many cases happened before, but not one of them as in Sheikh Jarrah. This is like uh, an evacuation, ethnic cleansing that is taking place. It's not, uh, there are 28 families. So it's a big number of persons that are going to be kicked out from their own houses. And we are, we are, uh, we are uh, accusing that uh, those who are uh, taking away the justice, taking away human resources, who are taking inhumanity action, and they are uh, punishing the whole population right there in Sheikh Jarrah. They, they, they don't take in their consideration that in the neighborhood there are settlers, they were replaced by Palestinian families. Nobody is accusing them. Even uh, two days ago, they were throwing uh, stones, uh, chairs, uh, and so on. You don't see justice right over there. You see only police and mil Israeli military actions are protecting those illegal settlers who are confiscating our houses and sitting in, 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 in it, kicking those families the uh, Palestinian families who were kicked by them a few years ago. So where is justice? Where is a, a human uh, needs? Where are... A, 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 we, we don't see a, a really uh, a actions that are really supporting those Palestinian families who were replaced in Sheikh Jarrah by the UNRWA and the, and the Jordan government since 1956 uh, after an Nakba. So now, Fadwa, Fadwa what, are the, what are the legal mechanisms? Are there any legal mechanisms that will allow the Palestinians to be able to stay in their homes under Israeli law? The only legal issues is those uh, papers that shows uh, that they are there replaced by the Jordan government and uh, the UNRWA since that period. But in, in the fact, uh, there were papers, other papers that uh, said that the, after three years of being there, a uh, Jordan government, uh, with the help of the UNRWA, uh, will uh, re registered their uh, those houses in the family names, but this is didn't happen, and the war had started 1960, in 1967, and uh, so they didn't continue the, the 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 case. So, do you think that in such condition the settlers have the right to be replaced by those families? In, in such conditions, what? Any, we, we, we don't see that uh, those families uh, are the ones who would be accused. They were the ones who were replaced in those houses instead of their houses, their own assets, that mm. had they, they lost since 1948 after Nakba. So imagine the difference uh, between uh, and Nakba and those illegal settlers that are now going to kick those Palestinian families. So they are, it's, it, uh, Nakba, it became like twice for them. In 1948, their assets were confiscated and they were kicked out from their assets by the Israelis in 1948 within the Nakba issue. And now this is another uh, Nakba for them. Well, let's, so, let's talk about that. What? Let's talk about the actual laws itself. I want to bring in uh, Yossi Meckelberg, who joins us uh, from London. Yossi, what are the Jewish activists, the Jewish settlers, what laws are they using to make the claim that they actually own those properties before 1948? As far as I can work out, these are Ottoman era laws that they're using, aren't they? Well, first of all, let's not kid ourselves. It's not a legal matter per se. 
It's a political first and foremost. What the settlers are doing, they are using legal tools in order to execute their own political strategy, intentional, deliberate attempt to make a two states a solution to render it impossible. Now, from a legal point of view, yes, some of these houses were owned which, before 1948 by Jewish families, and I don't think many would, would dispute it. But at the same time, so much of the property was owned inside Israel, not in the occupied territories, inside Israel, proper, within the Green Line, by the 750,000 original refugees. And I don't think they, any one of them, or the descendant of the refugees, will find any remedy in Israeli courts to reclaim their property. So the ownership is there, but this time actually to look at it from a political so now it will go back to the to the Supreme Court, and and I hope they will reconsider and understand that in the balance of interest, yes, there might be ownership there, but the result of it might be much worse in political terms, in terms of of, of violence. And again, I, to to say that there is status quo, there is no real status quo in Jerusalem. Or what is there is an occupation which 40% of the population has no rights or very little rights, and 60% of the Jewish population has the rights, and the Palestinians have not the same access to, to justice, to the courts in Israel, as the Jewish population. But you'll see, what, a lot of what we're hearing from the Palestinian side is that actually in those neighborhoods, under uh, Jordanian law, when they were under, when it was Jordan, they were given protected residence status, which means they're allowed to live there. So what is the what is the political motivation behind this? Why, like, I just I'm trying to understand if there isn't a legal case. What's the political motivation behind it? At the end of the day, the political motivation of these settlers that have their supporter in government, or at least those in government that don't want clash with the interests of the settler, is to make a two-state solution based on Jerusalem as both capital of Israel and Palestine completely impossible. What they try to encircle by joining together the Jewish neighborhood, whether it's in Silwan, that there is a very similar uh, situation, or, or, or in uh, Sheikh Jarrah, at the same time to exclude from Jerusalem, like Shoafat and the refugee came to create demography which favors the Jewish population in Jerusalem. And when they finish to encircle the old city with Jewish uh, a neighborhood, that will make it almost, and cut it by the way from Bethlehem, that will make it almost impossible to have a continuity between Palestine and Palestinian state, if it ever happens, and its capital in, in Al-Quds, in East Jerusalem. Well, let me bring in Rami Khouri here in Boston. Rami, once again, the Jewish settlers are riding roughshod over international law, whether it's humanitarian law or whether it's designed to protect those who are under occupation or who have been displaced from their homes. Now, the Jewish settlers are doing this, as Yossi pointed out, with support, tacit support, from their supporters within the Israeli Knesset. Is there anything the international community can do? The UN, uh, the EU and the US have called for restraint, but that's not happening. Uh, the modern history suggests that there is nothing the international community is going to do except issue strong statements that are not followed up by actions. The, the real situation is that you have the full force of the Israeli state and the uh, broader Zionist movement that started uh, uh, over a century ago supporting the Judaization of a land in Palestine that uh, at the Balfour Declaration in 1915 was 93% Palestinian Arab and it's about 6-7% Jewish. So you've got the settlers running wild. You've got the Israeli army and military forces more or less supporting them. You've got the political system in Israel, which is increasingly right of center supporting them. And you have the legal system in Israel supporting them. And there's a new element now, which is not really new. It's been there, again, since 1915 till to now, which is very successful Zionist Israeli manipulation of the international media through various mechanisms that they use, lobbying and intimidation, etc., uh, to try to silence the Palestinian voice and to have the Israeli narrative dominate 
the global media that this is just self-defense, we're just applying the law. And of course, this is what all uh, authoritarian and autocratic regimes around the world do. They say we're just applying the law. Well, the law is designed to create a Jewish state in a land that had been overwhelmingly Arab. And this is the continuation from the Nekba in 47, 48 until today. That's the underlying political uh, issue. Um, and it has to be addressed politically. The Palestinians are essentially leaderless now. The Jerusalem Palestinians are doubly leaderless because the Israelis have not allowed any Palestinian institutions in Jerusalem to persist and work, community uh, groups, political groups. Uh, so the only thing they can do is throw plastic chairs and, and, uh, and uh, shoes and, and stones, and they do that. And this is why this immense uh, popular resistance comes up spontaneously. Every time there's something in Jerusalem, you get thousands and thousands of Palestinians out in the streets just standing there trying to say, we're not leaving, we're not going anywhere. What you're actually talking about, I think, and let's not shy away from using the word, is effectively apartheid, right? Is that what you're saying? Well, apartheid already exists, and we've had the Human Rights Watch and other Salem and other people, Israeli and international respected groups, say that this is an apartheid-like system. There's no, there's no doubt about that. What it is is a sustained, century-old Judaization program in what had been Arab Palestine, and it's still going on. They use many techniques. They deny Palestinians in Jerusalem the right to live there if they spend more than six months or whatever it is outside of Jerusalem. They take away their residency cards. They make it impossible for people to travel and work. They've only allowed about 5%, I think, of Palestinians to be immunized against the uh, uh, virus now. Uh, so the, the, the aim of the Zionist movement and the state of Israel, its modern incarnation, uh, is to keep minimizing the number of Palestinians, Arabs there, so that you can have a predominantly or totally Jewish state. But the terrible irony, the cruelty of this, both for the Palestinians and the Arabs uh, and the Israelis, especially for the Israelis, the number of Palestinian Arabs now between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean is greater than the number of Jewish Israelis there. It's a, quite an extraordinary reality. And this is something that the Israelis don't know how to deal with. They call it a demographic uh, threat, which is racist in its own way. Uh, so, and this is, so that's the bigger picture. And it needs a political resolution. It needs a resolution, either two states or one democratic state. Democratic single state, the Israelis will never accept. Uh, so two states is the only thing that might work. And that's becoming increasingly difficult because of the uh, Judaization and colonization program of the Israeli government. And the world seems to accept it. They don't really, there's no major international pressure uh, until now. And this is doubly tragic for the Palestinians and for, for the rule of international law. Well, let's bring in Fadwa Khadar here in Occupied East Jerusalem. Our guest in Boston, Rami Khoury, has said, actually, it needs political pressure. But there is no body to put that pressure on. The Palestinians are, as we've discussed, in effect, leaderless. Um, and in occupied East Jerusalem, as Rami pointed out, they're doubly leaderless. I mean, where, are you, where can you go from here? I think um, Rami, uh, thank you, Rami, for, uh, first of all, for your explanation. Uh, by you, by, uh, from, you, from this channel, we are raising our voices highly. We know very well that Israel and the Zionist movement all around the world are attacking us, as has been mentioned before uh, through the interviews today. And uh, through you, we are able to hire our voices towards having really justice and having the establishment and the recognition of our state with its uh, East Jerusalem as a capital. Only this, and to follow up the United Nations declaration to be improved, improved, because we are, uh, we, 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 we are really uh, surprised from not taking actions, really actions till now, towards democracy, towards having real justice in our country, towards having peace, towards recognizing uh, Palestine as a state besides Israel state. We as Palestinians, we have recognized them, but they don't want, as you know very well, and as has been mentioned, they don't want to recognize us. So from, from here on, 
we want every single activist around the world to be with us, to support us, to be in solidarity with us, and to push world for to follow up the international laws, the international human rights law. Where are the implementation of this law? Why we don't uh, uh, mm. we 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 don't ask for uh, uh, to to punish Israel for its criminality for now? Well, let's Israel let's bring in your C- let's bring in your C- Meckelberg here. He's um, he uh, as ever. He's one of the people that kind of understands what Israel might be thinking. Is Israel? playing a very dangerous game here. If those 750 families get evicted, Hamas has to react, and Hamas knows in Gaza itself that if they don't react, the Gazans will do something. If they react, that means there's another more tensions in the Gaza Strip. The issue of Sheikh Jarrah isn't just about occupied East Jerusalem anymore. It's a cross-Palestinian issue. And that could mean that there might be another war in Gaza because Hamas will have to react. Is that, is that true, do you think? I agree with you. I think Israel is playing a very dangerous game. I think Israel in its complacency, I would even say arrogance, think that they can do whatever they like, whether it's in, in Jerusalem or the entire West Bank. They feel that with the with the normalization of relations uh, in other parts in the Middle East, there are nothing what to fear. I would say two things. A, the occupation also changed the Israel, uh, uh, the Israel society in a way that it's, a, it's, it's much worse than it used to be, including the political instability and other aspects of the Israeli society. Not that it should worry the Palestinians as such, but it's something that the Israeli society should really worry about its own character and how it has lost since 1967 is democratic character. B, yeah, this can, whatever in Jerusalem, as a microcosmos of the conflict as a whole, can lead to clashes in, in Jerusalem, which will get even worse than what we've seen in the last 48 hours, even in the last few weeks. It can lead to a war in, in, in Gaza. And we saw in 2000 that this was the trigger for the second intifada, not the cause of it, but definitely a, a, a trigger. So this is something that the Israeli leadership to take into account. But when I say leadership, where is the leadership in Israel right now? Uh, the supposed uh, prime minister is busier with, with dealing with his corruption case and trying to stay in power and out of jail. The rest are trying to form a coalition. Sorry, Yossi, we are and running out of time. And I do want to come to, to Rami Khoury as well. Rami, it's an interesting word that Yossi Merkelberg used there. We don't really hear it very often anymore, but intifada. Are we looking... Mm-hmm. at a potential third intifada when it comes to the Palestinians. And by intifada, we mean revolution. Well, uh, intifada is, is a popular uprising um, to just uh, express people's uh, humanity and their re- refusal to acquiesce in their own uh, uh, suppression and dehumanization and oppression. Uh, and, and this is already going on. There's a slow intifada that's been going on uh, for the last 25 years, and it occasionally bursts out into the two big ones. But even intifadas, even Hamas firing missiles, uh, none of these have resolved the issue. They've only seen Israeli colonization uh, expand, settler violence expand, and the continued support of the Israeli political and legal systems supporting what the settlers are are doing. So the only way that this issue is going to be resolved is either if there is a serious international intervention to force both sides to negotiate a reasonable agreement that's reasonable for the Israelis and the Palestinians, which I believe can still be done, or it's going to come from within uh, these societies uh, in terms of either tremendous clashes uh, or, miraculously, some uh, enlightened leaderships on both sides, which is also possible, but we don't see signs of it. Enlightened leaders might pull their people away from the brink they're at now into a uh, a continuation of the of the negotiations. We've had 40 years of negotiations uh, with almost zero uh, results. And I think you have to go back to recognize that the Zionist colonization of Palestine is a process that has been going on since the late 19th century. We're now into the third century of this process. And the Palestinians keep resisting, keep fighting. There were 750,000 Palestinian refugees in 1948 who, who fled or were driven out. Uh, they're now somewhere around four or five million. And so the numbers game is very much against Israel. 
Um, the legal game is also probably against Israel if you see the increasing global uh, affirmation of Israeli apartheid. Uh, and at some point soon, the political uh, support that Israel has, almost uh, total political support in the West, is starting to crumble because people see the consequences uh, of letting mm. this situation drag on. And mm. it's terrible for the Israelis, as Yossi said, and it's terrible for the Palestinians. Right. Right. Well, I want to thank all our guests. We are sadly out of time. Fadwa Khadr, Yossi Merkelberg and Rami Khoury. And thank you too for watching. You can see this and all our other previous programs again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. We are at AJ Inside Story from me, Imran Khan and the whole team here. Bye for now.